In our last installment, our last ser- a message from the series, Navigate, today we're going to be talking about how do we navigate through loss. But before we get there, I just want to uh, get us open- started with this declaration. But actually, before that, I'm wearing this T-shirt. This is the T-shirt that people are going to receive today uh, who have made that decision to get water baptized. And we're really excited about that. It's going to happen after our second service. And I, I just feel led to just, maybe you're, uh, you're here, and maybe you gave your heart to Christ Giving our heart to Christ, is, it's like a private matter. You may be sitting in that seat, you receive Jesus. But water baptism is just a public proclamation of what's happened in your heart. And when you get water baptized, you're, you're saying to the whole world, I am fully surrendered to Christ, and I'm going to follow him all the way. And so that's going to happen after second service. So if you have not made plans to be a part of that, you still can. We have everything you need. Just make sure that you hit our bookstore or our information center, and you get one of these T-shirts, and they're so cute, and I love them. Okay, so let's... Let's get ready for, let's get ready for, uh, to receive the word of God. And for those of you who are visiting, we do this declaration to get our hearts ready to receive from God. So say with me, today, I will hear the voice of God through the word of God. My eyes will be enlightened and I will be changed. Now turn to your neighbor, look them in the eye and say, I will be changed. Look to another neighbor that you didn't choose before and tell them, I will be changed. Now, come on, look up at me and tell me, I will be changed. changed. Oh, someone's really excited. So, listen, and I believe that because, and and those of you who have been coming, you've heard me say this every time that we're in the presence of God, and we are in the presence of God. Every time we're in the Word of God, it's an opportunity for God to transform us. A little at a time, a little at a time, we get better and better. So that's what I'm excited about today. So in this series, what we've been doing is we've been talking about navigating through the storms of life. Storms are coming. We live in a fallen world. Stuff is going to happen. So I want to open up with this scripture. This has been our key scripture. And Jesus said this, and it's in Matthew chapter 7. It says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, so you're not just hearing something, you're actually doing something with it, is why, it it, it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock, though the rain comes in, the torrents, though the rain comes and the torrents come and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, storms come in, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. It's built, this house is built strong, immovable. But anyone who hears my teachings and does not obey, it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So Jesus was saying there are storms that are going to hit every single one of us. And we've been specifically talking about the storm of, uh, so far we dealt with disappointment, huge storm that hits every single one of us, betrayal, and last week we talked about criticism. And one of the things, as we've been going through this series, we can't prevent a lot of those storms. Some of them we can, but a lot of them we're not going to prevent. But through Christ, with Christ, through his word, we can actually navigate through that storm, not be swept away, instead come out stronger, come out uh, with our capacity grown, and be in a better place. And we also show through the series that a lot of times uh, the, the storm that we may be walking through runs parallel to the breakthrough that we need. That if we'll stay to the course, if we'll navigate with God, we'll actually hit that breakthrough and be better off. So today, we're going to be talking about loss. And I'm not just talking about loss of a loved one, although that is something that I have walked through personally. And for those of you who are visiting, in 2002, my first husband, he uh, went to be be with Jesus. He died of cancer. And so I'm, I'm not a stranger to walking through that kind of a tragedy. But I also want to talk about not just the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of a dream. Loss of a relationship. You know, it's, it's, um, divorce is really hard. And it's like a death when people go through divorce. And it's a loss. How do I navigate through that loss? Loss of maybe the dream job. Whatever that is, loss. I was doing this, now I'm no longer doing that. 
Um, and and I, I want to start, start with uh, this, this um, opening line because this is what really dropped in my spirit. In your notes, how we navigate loss many times determines where we land in our relationship with Christ, which is the most important thing ever, and even in our purpose. The enemy will use loss to, to, to shipwreck our faith and forfeit our destiny. Because when we go through a loss, uh, it, it just it goes with the territory. We go through a little bit of that confusion, and we don't understand, and we have all the questions of why. And a lot of times when we get into the questions of why, we begin to pull away from God because of the pain, and we don't understand. And uh, I see this quite a bit when it comes to the loss of a dream, or maybe you're praying for something, and maybe you heard, you know, I heard that God gives you the desires of your heart. I heard that ask, and you will receive, and, and you did, and, and it didn't happen. Loss of a dream. And, and I, I heard this, this past week, I was talking to one of our members, and she was telling me about how her mother She'd come to, uh, to be a follower of Christ, and she was really excited. In fact, she, a lot of her family came to know Christ because of her. Uh, she ended up, you know, the desire of her heart was to get married and have that relationship. She, well, she married this man. He was new in Christ. He had come out of a homosexual lifestyle. And so everything was great at the beginning of their marriage, but a few years into the marriage, she noticed that some of those tendencies were coming back. And by five, but at the five-year mark, their marriage had been terminated because he'd gone full-blown back into that lifestyle. And as a result of that, as a result of the loss of that relationship, she turned away from God completely. God did not come through for me. God did not fulfill his word in my life. He must not be who he says that he is. Now, can, And so then there was this, this, this uh, young man as well that I knew, uh, at a young age, he was playing hockey, and he was very, very good at it, and um, he was a churchgoer. His family all went to church. He himself, uh, you know, was a churchgoer. Did he have this really deep relationship with Jesus? No, but, you know, he went to church, and uh, there's a big difference between going to church and having a deep relationship with Jesus. It's so different. It's so, so different. Just because you park in a, a car doesn't make, or park in a garage doesn't make you a car, right? Um, did I get that right, or did I say that wrong? <laughs> I said it completely wrong, and I know I'm going to hear about that for days from you. I know, I know. Um, he's the eloquent one. So, uh, anyways, so, um, anyways, this this young man, he, um, so he was he was in that place of trying to get drafted to a professional team, and in that season. He was really looking to God and talking to God, and same thing, God, you're going to give me the desires of my heart, ask, and you will uh, receive, right? And it didn't happen. And so as a result, he really turned away from God, called, called himself a backslider. Again, well, God did not come through for me. And I, can I just, like, can we, like, be open here? In any, have you ever gone through a time where you said, God didn't come through for me? You actually had those feelings. You had those thoughts. You know, and you don't have to be holier than thou in this place. Okay? We're open and we're honest here. We're human beings. There are things that we struggle with. That is normal, but we can't stay there. And so let's, I just want to look at some of those scriptures that people have used and then, and then had questioned God so that we could grow today in regards to this idea of loss. In Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, Delight yourself on the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that word delight is an interesting word. It literally means, if you study that word, it means to be pliable, to be moldable, to be, allow yourself to be shaped, to come under, to be submitted to. So it says, be pliable in the Lord, be moldable in the Lord. Let him take off those sharp edges. Come under what he says, not what you think. Let, your, let him lead you, not your feelings, okay? Now, that 
that delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. The reason why he'll give you the desires of your heart, when we come under and we allow God to transform us, every time you're in his presence, every time you're in your word, you're allowing God to transform, to mold, to shape, to make you pliable. That's the sharpening tool. And what happens when we allow ourselves in that process, our desires actually become one with his desires. We actually step into our created design, desire that God had always purposed for us. It comes out of this delighting ourselves in him, which takes us to the next verse, John 15, 7. It says, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. If you let yourself be moldable, pliable, let me transform you. Just get in my presence. Get in my word. Let me do some supernatural things to your soul that only I can do. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. You can't take one part of that verse out of that. You can't just take a part of it out of that verse. It's the whole thing. So there's this abiding in his presence that causes us to, our desires and his desires to just connect, to be one, and then they begin to happen. It's a process. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, it's a process. So I want to use this example uh, to show you this. So uh, our heart, our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions, they're shaped over time uh, by the world that we live in, by the culture that we're surrounded with, with various observations, associations, and teachings that we receive. We take in all of this data from the world, and it, it affects and, and creates and molds our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions. Now, when we actually become a follower of Jesus, we have the privilege of God's very spirit coming to live on the inside of our spirit man. And he comes and he dwells there. It's an immediate supernatural. You're born anew. God's spirit lives in you. You are a child of God. But your soul is still a mess. And it needs transformation. So this bowl here with this blue water represents a soul of one who just, just received Christ, right? Now, unless there are touchdown points with God, Unless the word of God, the presence of God, unless we have those touchdown points, the blue cannot be changed to clear. So let's just say I, one morning I get up and I spend some time with the Lord and I, I'm abiding in his presence. Okay, Will one drop of that clear water do anything to this blue water? We all know that something happened, but we really can't see the significance of it, right? But what if... I repeatedly just kept doing this, kept doing this. Eventually, what would happen? Eventually, that blue would overflow, and it would be completely clear. And that, and that clear means you're receptive, you're open, your heart is becoming one with the Lord. Remember, you're made in his image, and the goal of our growth in him is to become more and more like him in character and motivation and in perception. I'm so excited that we actually get to be a part of that process. That's amazing. So these are touchdown points, right? If we don't have these touchdown points, there's no abiding. So we're not going to ask for the right things, right? And it's interesting that Jesus actually talks about a person uh, that, that gets excited about Jesus. Here's, oh, God's going to give you the desires of your heart. Oh, I'm so excited, but then they fall away. He talks about it's a seed that went on uh, a rocky soil. It's in Mark chapter 4, verse 16. It says, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, God, I got a purpose and a plan for my life, and, and God's going to heal me and deliver me, and, and he's going to give me the desires of my heart. This is great. This is great. They're really excited because they heard about God. Maybe they heard someone else's testimony. Maybe they just heard one message. But since they don't have deep roots, there have not been touchdown points. There hasn't been time to allow God to mold and shape that heart, right? But since there hasn't been touchdown points, they fall away as soon as they have problems. Another translation says they fall away because of persecution for the word's sake, meaning I thought that that word was true and it didn't happen. They fall away. Just 
Maybe that dream didn't come to pass because God saw down the road, he who has the bigger picture of our life, he saw down the road that that desire and that dream was going to hurt you. That it was going to derail you from your real purpose. But what God had called you to be, that just maybe it was going to take you away from your, your family and your spouse. Just maybe God saw the bigger picture and saw it wasn't the best thing for you right now. Just maybe he needed some maturity, some trust to grow so that you could be faithful with that dream. Just maybe. Just maybe in your notes, we need to develop a deeper relationship for greater trust. You cannot trust what you don't know. You can't. And God, God desperately, desperately wants you to grow in this relationship with him where you can trust him because he wants to do things that you can't even imagine. The promise of God says above and beyond what you can ask or think he wants to do in your life. But it says according to the power that works in you, according to those touchdown points that are being developed in you, trust does not happen overnight. It's a process. Are you following me? So when it comes to the loss of life, again, I am no stranger to this, and uh, I want to show you how the scripture actually promises us a long life. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. So we see from the word, God establishes this time frame for our time on earth to be in these earth suits. Uh, our, earth, our earth season versus our heaven season. And our earth season is so small. It's so minute compared to our heaven season. And so um, I found this article that I want to read to you because science has proved what God has said in his word that we can live a full, healthy, long life. Uh, and it says, it's this, um, it's, it's based on the science of gerontology. And this is a, a medical science that studies aging. All human cells are able to reproduce themselves only a certain number of times. This is estimated to be about 50 cell divisions, which estimated would place the human life at between 100, 115 and 120 years. Researchers can study a culture of human cells as they divide repeatedly until a maximum of 50 or 60 divisions which equates to 120 years. Isn't that interesting? I love how science is trying to catch up with what God has already said, right? And not only that, which is wonderful about this gracious, merciful, loving God. In Psalm 91, 16, he says this. It's a promise. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, it's a promise. He says, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That word salvation, this is what he's saying. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my preservation, my deliverance, my prosperity, my wholeness. I mean, it's, it's an all-inclusive word. It's an abundant life because God is good and he's gracious. So I said all that to say this. In your notes, we are given a life. We have to steward it. We have to steward the life that he gives us. These 120 years that he gives us, he gives us the free will to steward it. And he gets involved as we let him. So uh, several years, well, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, my mom gave me a house. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> She's amazing. So, so once, once I got this house... My husband and I had to maintain the house, which means we had to, you know, make sure, keep up with the painting and, and keep up with the cleaning and the maintenance of all of the appliances and, and changing those air filters and, and, and making sure that we pulled the weeds and mowed the lawn and cleaned the pool and, and dusted and organized. And we had to maintain it. So what would happen if we didn't maintain it? It'd fall apart. 
right? I was given a house, but I had to maintain that house, keep it pristine, right? It's the same thing. God gives us a relationship, a marriage. That's not the end goal. Now we have to maintain that marriage, maintain that relationship. And I believe the reason why a lot of our marriages are breaking down, it's because we are uh, allowing the knowledge of culture to shape our marriages instead of the knowledge of the Creator. And so God designed our relationship, our marriages to be awesome, to be the icing on the cake, to be, oh, just that, that one thing that just fulfills us throughout that day. That's what he designed for us. But what I've seen is most of the time we're struggling in our relationship. Just maybe it's because we don't know some things about what God said about marriage. They have to be maintained. It's the same thing with our physical bodies. God gives us a physical body. They're incredibly made. I mean, these immune systems that, that were created to ward off sickness and disease that were created to keep us strong and to be 120. But we have to maintain it. And we have to eat the right things, right? We have to watch those stress levels. They say that 90% of the sicknesses and diseases today, the heart disease and the cancers, they're caused by stress. Stress in the mind. Mind stress. Worry, it's literally breaking down our immune system. And we're not resting. And, and we are really, today, we're so sedentary. We were not created to be a sedentary society. We were an agricultural society at one time. We were moving all the time, and we were created to move. So God gives us this physical body. We have to maintain it. And come on, we're really not that good at it, are we? We're not. You just think they're going to go the distance. No, God, he gave us a physical body. We have to, to maintain it. And really, this, this idea of stewardship, it really it starts in the womb. And uh, when I was pregnant with Alexa, uh, my second, um, my first pregnancy, my first uh, baby, I, I just, I had a horrible pregnancy, a horrible delivery, uh, pain as can be, and some of you have heard my testimony about how um, I got a hold of the promises of God about having a supernatural childbirth and so my so second time around, I was going for the supernatural childbirth. And um, so this one day I was in, I was having a touchdown point with God. It's in the Word of God. And I came across a scripture in Hebrews where it talked about how, uh, about Noah, how God instructed Noah to build an ark of prayer to, for the saving of his family. How many of you guys are familiar with that story? Noah's ark back there in the Old Testament. So I'm reading it, and, and I knew God was starting to speak to me about the baby in my womb. And I heard God say in my heart, it was not, it was not audible, it was right in my heart, but it was, okay, he is speaking. And he, and he said to me, build an ark of prayer around your baby, around your womb, for the saving of your baby. I knew at that moment that the enemy, Satan, had planned an attack against the baby that was growing inside of me. And I had an understanding something had something to do with the crippling of feet. And so a couple of weeks later, several weeks later, I can't remember the time from, it was kind of a long time ago, um, and uh, what, she's 22 now, so it's been 22 years. Um, I had this dream, and in the dream, I, was, I, I, I delivered Alexa in the dream, and it was supernatural. I had no pain. But in the dream, something was wrong. The nurse was not on her game. I had this understanding that she was under some kind of a substance abuse. And in the dream, she had done something to Alexa as she was coming out, and her feet were crippled in the dream. And I knew, oh, I see what you're trying to do, enemy. So just began to morning and night, touchdown points, just surround my womb with prayer, building that ark of prayer. She came out with beautiful feet. <laughs> Long, but beautiful feet. They did not take after me. They all, I'm so glad that they all are taller. So grateful for them. Um, anyways, it was about prayer. Now, Psalm 91, I just read you the very last verse of Psalm 91, but the very beginning of Psalm 91 it starts with this, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High, whoever abides in my presence, abides in my word. It doesn't say whoever visits every now and then. 
who visits on a Sunday, Christmas, and Easter. No, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Watch this. We'll find rest. I don't have to worry. I can rest. I've got this awareness. God is with me. God is for me. He's so big and he loves me. That does not, that does not just happen. It comes out of this dwelling after this growing, this relationship. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He trusts because He's been dwelling. He can say He's my refuge because He's been dwelling. Are you following me? It goes on to say, You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. You're not going to fear the storms of life, the calamities, the tragedies, the things that happen on a daily basis. You don't need to fear. Why? God's got your back. A thousand will fall at my side, 10,000 is right, and he will not come near me. And at the very end of that chapter, it says, because he loves me, says the Lord. Says the Lord. Oh. Because Alexa loves me, because James loves me, because you love me, says the Lord. Oh, because you, you hunger for this relationship with me. You finally figured it out that I'm really all you need. You finally figured it out how much I love you and the purpose and the plan that I have for your life. You finally figured out that I'm strong for every battle that you're ever going to face. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. I, for he acknowledges my name. He's trusting in my name, not his strength or what he sees with his own eyes. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's such a powerful psalm. The psalmist was able, and really the whole psalm talks about that the angels are going to take charge over me. It, it, it's, this, it's, about, it's a psalm of protection against the storms of life, the things that are going to come at us that, that have the potential to completely sideswipe up, side us, but instead we're upheld by God. And the psalmist was saying, no, God's got my back. And guys, this, this, this particular psalm was a psalm that carried me through the loss of my husband. In fact, my kids were probably 18 months, two years old when we started as a family memorizing the whole psalm. And every time we would get in the car, every time, we'd immediately start saying out loud Psalm 91 to the point that that when my girls would see something coming at them, that word would literally spew out of their mouth like a sword. It was so awesome to see. It got, it got so rooted in their heart that they were able to rest. And when they would see something coming at them, it was an amazing thing. And so when my husband passed, here I'm experiencing one of the greatest tragedies of my life. That psalm was like this embalming grace around me. I knew, God, you got my back. A lot of things just don't make sense. And I don't have a lot of clarity, but you got my back. God, you're with me. You see, a lot of times when we go through a tragedy, the loss of a spouse, the loss of a baby, the loss of a child prematurely, what happens is that in your notes, we often look to our personal pain our personal disappointment instead of the bigger picture, right? We get so drawn in to the pain and to the disappointment, that's, and that is, that's quite normal. It's difficult to see the big picture. But there's a big picture. There is stuff going on that in these natural physical bodies, in these limited minds, we cannot see everything. Look at the scripture in, Psalm, or in Isaiah 57, verse 1. It says, good people pass away. The godly often die before their time, but no one seems to care or wonder why. 
And no one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. Just maybe God saw down there, mm, oh, this is what's best. Just maybe. And I'm going to say for every time, the point I'm trying to make, there's a bigger picture. And sometimes we just can't see it because the pain is so deep. And uh, a couple of, uh, there were a couple of things that have happened to me that have helped me to keep the bigger picture, even when my first husband passed. And the, uh, there was this preacher who I, I so admired. Um, I sat underneath his teaching for a very long time. He's passed now. And he was teaching, uh, telling the story this one time that he was invited to go pray for this young man who he was in bed and he had dealt with substance abuse his whole life. He had these strong highs with God and then he'd fall. And then he had these strong highs with God, and then he'd fall. So now he's in bed. He's really, really sick. He's on his deathbed. They call him in to pray for him. And he went to lay his hands on his head to pray for him. The scripture talks about believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So he was simply doing a promise from the word of God. And as he put his hand on his head, the Holy Spirit, literally the presence of God, pushed his hand away from his head. So he did it again, like, what's going on here? So he reached out and put his hand on his head again. And second time, pushed his hand away. He did it one more time. And the Spirit of God pushed his hand away. So finally he backed up and he said, God, what's going on here? He said, don't pray for him. His heart is in the best place for his greatest eternity. In other words, before he falls again and forfeits a greater reward in heaven, which is forever compared to this little minuscule time on earth. He said, he's coming home. He's coming home. Just maybe we're not seeing the bigger picture. And then my husband, Marcus, a few days after he had passed, had this dream. And uh, maybe some of you are familiar, God does use prophetic dreams to speak to people. It's one of, it's one of the gifts that we, we get to have. And he's spoken through dreams so many times to me, warnings. Um, and so, but this particular dream was quite interesting, and it's the grace and the mercy of God. Um, in the dream, um, Marcus had come back, and my first husband's name was Marcus. He came back uh, to, to visit with me, but it, he really didn't want to be with me. In the dream, he kept looking. It's like I was over here, and he was looking up at God like this. He wouldn't even look at me. And I was getting so mad. And he kept, and, and, I, and I could see in his eyes like, okay, I came. Now, can I come back now? Okay, she saw me. Can I come back now? He did not want to be with me. And I was getting so mad in the dream. I kid you not, in the dream, I was literally full on punching him and hitting him. And so and I was hitting his back, and he's just doing this. Okay, are we done? Are we done? Would not look at me. And I understood from the dream that when he stepped into heaven and experienced a real, true freedom... He said, I'm never going back. I'm never going back to that. I wasn't enough to bring him back. He experienced what he so wanted, freedom. And that helped me. God let me see the bigger picture. Isn't that amazing about God? Isn't he just so, so gracious? So the most important element if we're going to navigate loss is having the right focus, the right perspective. And the first thing is this, and I, I can only share with you from my personal experience how I navigated this and how I've come out of it stronger and better, doing things I never dreamed I'd ever do, above and beyond what I can ask or imagine because God is good and he's faithful. The first is this, don't blame God, run to God. In the pain, with your mind racing, don't blame God. Don't get angry at God. It's such a waste of time. Run to God instead. The next is this. Choose to believe God has your back. He loves you so much. He loved you enough to die for you. 
He died for you, that you could experience heaven, that you could live with him for all eternity. Had he not done that, he couldn't be with you. And he, he couldn't stand that thought, so he sent his best, his son, to take your place on that cross. Choose to believe God has your back. Look at this, this wonderful scripture. And this is a scripture that, that during the time of his passing, I meditated on this scripture. And it says, and we know that in all things, God works. That word, I'm pretty sure it's energeo. He works. He's supernaturally working for the good of those who love him. He's working things out in ways that we don't understand, but he is because he's God and he loves us. And who have been called according to his purpose. In that season, I had to trust what he said, not what my feelings were saying. I had to trust you're working things out. I remember one time I was looking at that scripture going, it don't feel like you are working things out for my good. Have you ever said that once to God? Come on, be honest. I'm going to share this testimony with you. Again, we see, God sees this way right? We see from this perspective. Okay. So when I signed the death papers, he passed, and I, it was so, it was just, I was like just in a, a, a total cloud, and um, we get into the elevator to go down to the parking lot to get our car, and my mom was with me. My mom is a prayer warrior. It's from her. I learned about prayer, and and, and hungering for the presence of God and worshiping the Lord. And in the elevator going down, I just signed his death papers. God spoke to my mom. He said, in two years, she will be settled. She'll be in a relationship and settled. My mom understood that means that God had another for me, that God had already had someone prepared and ready. It was this amazing man on the front row who I love so much. <laughs> James is brilliant. I mean, he really is. I mean, he's really cute, but he's really brilliant. <laughs> he is brilliant. And so I married him for... <laughs> well, you just stop it. That's not allowed. <laughs> so she's hearing from God in an elevator going down that in two years... God had already, everything, was working everything out. Now, she didn't tell me in that elevator, because if she would have, I would have slapped her upside the head. <laughs> I didn't want anybody. I wanted Marcus. I couldn't imagine life without him. He was my life, literally. So, two years to the date, two years to the date, we were in a relationship, looking at homes. I kept telling you, you can't propose to me yet. My kids are not ready. I was trying to hold him back two years to the day. Listen, God said, so, okay, I know that this is a tragedy, and I don't believe it was God's best. But God was saying, okay, I've, I've got your back, Tracy. I'm working things out for your kids and for you. I know you can't see it now, but I'm working it out. I'm working it out. He's so faithful. Next one is this, and this is, is choose an eternity perspective. Choose an eternity perspective. When I would wake up in the morning, I didn't want to get out of bed. And I, I'm pretty sure those who have experienced a, a, a loss have felt that way. And I knew that that was a sign of depression, but I still would get up. And, and I know that the Spirit of God led me to say this and to, and to focus on this. See, seeing everything that we walk through, we don't have to walk through in our own strength. We have... The Holy Spirit, he's our honored guest that lives in us, that will strengthen us and help us through whatever tragedy we go through. And so I would get up and I would say with my mouth, without any feelings, I would say, Lord, I am alive to destroy the kingdom of darkness and to build your kingdom where rust and moth does not destroy I still have purpose. I still have an assignment. And until there is breath in me, I will fulfill what you have called and made me to do. Now, I want you to know something. I had no feeling when I said that. There was no feeling. But I understood from the word and the help of the Holy Spirit, I still had an eternal purpose. I still had to make a dent in hell. The next one is this. Um, Meditate on his love. 
Meditate on his love. This is like, you know, if, if you've got something going on physically in your body, some, you, you take some Tylenol, you take something, right? You take a pill. I'm telling you, this scripture that I'm going to give you was my medicine. It was my pill to my soul. First John 4, 18, it says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. One day as I was reading in the Word, it was just a few days after he had passed, when I said, God, I don't even know where to read. I don't even know what to do. He took me to this scripture. There is no fear in love, but perfect love dries out fear. And so I would literally, a um, hundred times a day, I would say, God, you love me. God, you love me. This doesn't make sense. This hurts. This is painful. But you love me. And somehow, because you love me, this is all going to make sense one day. Somehow, I'm going to feel again. Somehow, because you love me, I'm not going to feel this pain anymore. And I'm going to see things differently because you love me. I know that my kids are going to be all right. Because you love me, they're not going to be scarred. Oh, because you love me. Because you love me. Because you love me. It was my medicine. A hundred times a day I'd say that. That was the only, that, that was how I, I got relief. And then the last one was this. So you got to meditate on his love. See, because the enemy wants to separate you from God's love for you. He takes advantage of our vulnerability. He takes advantage of, of the pain that we're experiencing. And I'm going to say this, you better be in community. I needed people around me to help me. I couldn't do this by myself. I'm so grateful I was a part of a praying church. There were times when I'd be walking and saying that, that I would literally feel the prayers of the people from our church. I was so grateful. I want to take you to this next scripture. And your feeling is receive God's supernatural comfort. 2 Samuel 19, or 12, 19 through 20, David, King David in the Old Testament, his son, his baby, dies. We pick up, no, David noticed that his attendants were whispering amongst themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had wa watched this, after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Wait, 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 wait. My son is dead. I have to go into the presence of God and I got to worship. Why did he go into the house of the Lord and worship? It's because in that place of worship, in that place of surrender, he was allowing God to comfort him. And that's what we need when we're going through a loss. It's not the time to run from God. It's the time to run to God. And God, I need you. God, I worship you. I can't do this, God. And let me tell you, when we worship that way, his presence comes in like a flood. And that enemy, that spirit of grief, it just begins to dispel. It's a powerful thing. And there was a particular CD at the time that I would worship to every day. I wore that thing out. It was by Martha Munizzi. It's called The Best is Yet to Come. Some of you are familiar with that. Uh, and there was a song on that, say, on that CD. It was called Say the Name of Jesus. Because there were times I couldn't really say much because of what I was feeling and experiencing and I would literally just sing this song, and I would worship to him. And I'm going to try to sing it. You going to help me out? It's really, really simple. And as I sing this song, what I want you to do is just close your eyes and just let God minister to you. Becca, you can help me out. And it goes like this. Say the name. Of Jesus, say the name of Jesus, say the name so precious, no other name I know that can calm your fear. And dry your tears 
and wipe away all the pain when you don't know what else to pray when you can't find the words to say say the name oh, 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 oh. Jesus oh there's something about the name of Jesus Jesus Oh, Jesus, 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 and he's gonna make a way when you say Jesus, oh, Jesus, 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 oh, when you don't know what to pray. When you don't know what else to pray When you can't find the words to say Say the name Oh, Jesus, Jesus Jesus, Jesus Every head bowed, every eye closed Jesus wants to touch your soul what Jesus can do to a soul, no counselor, no medicine, no pill can do. He will go into the very depths of your being supernaturally and touch your soul and heal in a way that leaves no scars. And that's what he did to me and that's what he wants to do to you. He wants to go in this morning into that secret place of your soul that's been so hurting, so painful. And do a supernatural work if you let him. If you let him. Oh God, right now in the name of Jesus, I pronounce your supernatural peace to flood every soul in Jesus' name. Bless every soul with your peace as you did for me. Do for every person. Only you can heal that way. Only you can do that. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to do that fresh work right now. Right now. And just, just say, Lord, I receive. I receive, God. I receive, I receive, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, I give you praise. Oh, I worship you, worship you, worship you. You are so good. You are so faithful. Jesus. We're going to continue to pray again with every head bowed, every eye closed. We're so privileged as human beings that God loves us. He created us to be in this relationship with us, but he'll never push that relationship on us. He won't. It is an honor and a privilege to have the Spirit of God dwell in us. But He will not push Himself on us. He has to be welcomed. And maybe you're here and you've gone to church. Maybe you've heard about Jesus. But the question is, have you ever welcomed? Have you ever invited His Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to come into your heart, to come into your spirit? and make you a child of God. It is the greatest prayer, the greatest miracle that you could ever experience. It really does matter where you spend eternity, and there's no way that you can be with Him unless you're His. I want to pray with you this morning, and if you're here and you've never prayed that prayer, and you want to be included in that prayer, with every head bowed, every eye closed, quickly raise your hand, say, that's me, I want to receive Jesus. I see that hand, bless you. Bless you. Bless you. It's the greatest day of your life. And maybe you're here, you're that person that you're far away from God. And you know that you may have given your heart to Christ, but you never surrendered your soul fully to Him. And today you're saying, that's it, I'm done. I'm ready to surrender everything. Go all the way with God. Experience His fellowship like I've never experienced. If that's you, you're ready to recommit your life quickly. Raise your hand say, that's me. 
I need to recommit all over this place. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Now you can put your hands in. I'm going to pray this prayer. What I want you to do is repeat it after me. Every head bow, every eye closed. This is a holy moment. This is a miraculous moment. Repeat this prayer after me and let the Spirit of God flood you and change you. Some of you, your whole body is just shaking with His presence. He's simply saying, I love you. I got a plan and a purpose for your life. So say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I realize you love me. You died for me. You found me worthy to die for. I invite you into my heart to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Help me to live for you. Now, I believe with this prayer, you're in my heart. I am a child of God. Oh, thank you. Come on, give him some praise this morning. Oh, I give you praise.